What we're going to talk about is, is Ruby Rails uh, reporting application environment called Rupert. And, uh, and we'll show some lot of demonstrations. And uh, obviously, how it all connects into MySQL. We'll, uh, we're, we're going to do, we're going to have some slides. And we're going to have some uh, demonstration working code. The, the, uh, one of the things I'm going to, all of this is basically open source. Okay, so Ruby is open source. It's, it's basically a programming environment, a programming language, object oriented. Rails is an object oriented, it, it's an open source web framework that is built in Ruby. And uh, Rupert is also an open source environment for reporting. And what I'll show is I'll show a demonstration of an application sort of space that, that I've begun to prototype. It's in a uh, sort of an alpha, pre-alpha stage. Uh, so feel free to, uh, to shoot hot shots at it. There's pizza and drinks and all sorts of good stuff. Um, what I call data dashboard. So for me, the, the, as I kind of got into this, I, I, uh, about uh, some people who were here at one of the Ruby talks before, they've heard this before, but I kind of got interested in it. I did some PHP. I looked at Python. How many people have done Python? Or, so we got everything here. And, and uh, I heard about Ruby. It started up about a decade ago in the early 90s. Uh, came out of Japan. And the reason that it took really a long time to get over to the States was because none of the documentation was translated. It was all in Japanese. And so there's sort of this natural language barrier that, that uh, impeded the adoption of Ruby for quite some time. But then this guy, Dave Thomas, and a few other folks, they really sort of saw the beauty of Ruby, and uh, they had some skills at documentation and technical writing, and they sort of got together a small group of folks who started to develop documentation on how Ruby worked and what kind of a language it was and what you could do with it. And it really kind of caught on like wildfire, in particular over the past three or four years. Um, but the, sort of the... the T title of this, the working title of this talk is Three Hours of MySQL. Uh, we're going to do a, a tour of MySQL and Ruby on Rails. Um, basically, Rails is a web framework for developing data-driven applications. What that means is that web applications that have lots of data that gets pumped out to the web through browsers, okay? And the default database environment that people use to demonstrate what Rails can do is MySQL. If you look at all the books, if you look at all the examples, if you look at uh, sort of what the, the working stuff is that's out there, a lot of it is using MySQL. All that stuff should be very familiar to, to folks in this group who have had MySQL. And, and we'll go through some open source examples. Uh, but the question that kind of started me on, you know, I was doing PHP, I looked at that, I started looking at, at Python, wondering how I could come up with an environment where I could dynamically create query-driven reports. The idea is to put somebody down in front of a browser terminal and let them interact with the data that's out there. My particular interest is in financial applications, but it doesn't matter. It could be customer service. It could be, you know, the, the top 50 hits on, on music radio stations. But how do you allow people, how do you empower people who are browser users to create their own, um, their own query environments, basically? So these are the three R's that I see, Ruby, Rails, and Rupert. We'll go through some details in all of them. Uh, we're not going to get into any language wars here. There's, there's people on all sides of the, the battlefield with all the different languages. But uh, briefly, Ruby started in 93. 95 was the first release of it. But he's but, uh, a very, very creative, energetic guy. Uh, goes by the name of Matt in Japan, who's the principal architect behind this. And he's really just sort of a language genius. And he's developed this and was released for, for the first time in 95. Uh, there actually hasn't been a major release of Ruby for, I think, probably about a year now, almost. There's expected, one is expected at the end of this year, and it's going to really do some very interesting stuff. The characteristics of Ruby, and we'll show samples, um, it's multi-platform, so you can use it. Any of the platforms that people raise their hands for, it's open source. You can actually go in and mess with, you know, how it, how it uh, processes the, the language. It's a scripting language, so it's not compiled. The big change that's expected towards the end of this year is bytecode compilation, which for people who are sort of into this stuff realize that it's, you know, I know it's a 10x factor of improvement in uh, performance, but it's significant. Uh, if people have questions, feel free to, you know, jump in, shout out, whatever. Uh, I'm sorry, I kind of, that last, could you repeat that last part again? You said uh, about the bytecode yeah. stuff? So, so uh, what bytecode does is it's, uh, the script, it, currently it's sort of a scripting language, right? So it's very high level, it's easy to read, you can understand it. Um, but it doesn't do anything really smart when it compiles it down from that language down to the machine code, whether it's on Linux or Mac. or It's got kind of like an engine in there, but it's at a very high level. It's, it's inefficient. And so what the bytecode compilation will do is it will look for areas where 
uh, there are similar uh, instructions that are utilized. And it will sort of share that. So it will compile it down on the fly, one time to machine language, and then run that from then on in. Whereas the scripting language is much higher level. It's interpreted like basic. And so it, it just it's slower to operate. But I think you'll see, at least in all of the stuff that I've done, um, it's, you know, it's computationally pretty efficient. It moves along. And the thing is, with processors being what they are these days, it's like you don't notice it. You know, you just don't notice the slowness if there is any. Uh, what is duct type? Duct typing is, anybody know? Anybody want to offer up there? Yeah? Um, duct typing, so as if it looks like duct and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. But basically what that means is that you, know, you care less about what type something is and more about whether it responds properly to the message you sent it. So it's a typeless language? So it's a typeless language. No, it's, 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 not it's, quite, it's actually not quite a typeless language, typeless, but it it's a language type. that has no variable types. Objects have type, variables don't have types. That's sort of the way I like to say it. Type, it type. Exactly. That's still, right. that's still not quite correct. The type of the variable is set is determined when it's assigned. And it will change if it's assigned to something yeah. different. Yeah. It still is typed at that point. Right. The, the really nice thing from a developer, from a user standpoint, is that you, the, the software writer, don't, for the most part, have to work out what the type is. And for anybody who's done C, or heaven forbid, assembly language, you know you spend a lot of time trying to figure out what type should it be, how do I, you know, precisely uh, script that, and how, and when, it, when you don't have the right type, how do I dig myself out of this stuff? So, uh, for anybody who's done these kinds of languages, I think you move to something like this, and you say, wow. Yeah. And the other thing about this is that, uh, and duct typing is just sort of a phrase that we can't, well, I, I believe it was, it was uh, sort of proposed by this guy, Dave Thomas, who's written a number of the books. Um, which one? I'm sorry. Uh, the duct typing? No, no, go ahead. Uh, which book? <coughs> no, it's, he, it's Dave Thomas. I was reading your bottom bullet. It's on Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Is he hired by any of those four? Oh, yeah, no, he's, he's uh, still independent. So, well, I'll talk about that. Uh, as well, but the beauty of, of sort of, it, it, it's not typeless, it's not type free, but it's actually kind of, it's easy on developers from a type standpoint, okay? Um, but I would say eight times out of ten, maybe nine times out of ten, when I don't know how to do something in Ruby, and I sort of just instinctively try something, it, it actually works a very high percentage. Of time. I don't have anybody else that's sort of had bad experiences work with this stuff. One of the reasons actually is because um, oftentimes you can do things in two different ways. And so you don't necessarily have to, but it kind of doubles your chances of having a, a hit. Uh, the, the point about this, that Sun, Microsoft, Apple, and Google, uh, Sun has hired a couple of guys in who, who are uh, working on JRuby, which is uh, the Ruby interpreter written actually fully in Java. So the idea is that it can run on any Java platform in a Java environment. Why would that be interesting? First, first thing is, the first footnote, uh, it's still kind of under development. It is really slow. I, I mean, I've, the little bit that I've done, it's 10 times slower than, than native Ruby. So uh, the reason that it's really interesting is because you can get access to all sorts of Java libraries, of which there are just gazillions of them, right? Uh, which you can't do right now, running on Windows or Linux. Or, you know, it's really kind of difficult to access those libraries. It's very easy to access C libraries or C++ libraries or you know, OS libraries but not Java libraries. Sun is sort of working to, to remedy that. So they picked up a couple of guys who are developing open source and really believe in this stuff. Microsoft did exactly the same thing. This is all in the past six to nine months. Uh, there was a guy who's doing .NET stuff that was connecting uh, Ruby into the .NET world, and uh, they hired him. And uh, Apple, of course, they ship you know, uh, Ruby and Rails with the, the native machines. I don't know if anybody's used it. Yet. Ruby, I don't think they ship Rails yet. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I thought that they did, but and I, anyways, but I also thought that they the should one will have it. an older version, anyways. But 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 anyways, they're kind of getting on a bandwagon. And uh, and Google, although I, I actually don't know specifically people that they've hired. There's there's uh, at the end of April. There's a conference being held, a one-day conference that is in New York at Google's offices, and it's sold out. Um, but they're sort of on top of it enough that they've opened their doors to the Ruby community, in the, particularly in New York and uh, New and. New Jersey and Connecticut areas to sort of host this. Um, so it's, it's kind of a great language. Big, the other one I didn't mention because I don't know specifically if they've hired people, but IBM certainly is uh, heavily, uh, I guess, uh, writing about and, and, and sort of advocating in some ways the use of Ruby through the, they've got a great developer uh, works website where they've got lots of examples, lots of startup uh, things and things like that. Uh, I grabbed that pretty looking Ruby from 
Wikipedia. Uh, O'Reilly Radar, has anybody ever read that? Tim O'Reilly's blog where he basically, uh, you know, kind of tries to keep on the cutting edge of, of new technologies that are coming down the road and, and why they might be of interest. He sort of has this, this theory that books are a leading indicator of technology adoption, which uh, I see people nodding their heads that, you know, I certainly believe. So the question is what's, you know, what's interesting about this? And it's basically, if you look at the center of the graph, this is recent data. This is just like the past week or two. Um, if you look at, these are all sort of the, you know, the level of books and, and the blue is the, the sales for 2006 and the red is kind of the more recent sales. But, you know, if you look at them, I mean, some of them, they're all still pretty, and Python is miles ahead still, but uh, actually Ruby has, look at, this is what Ruby was last year and this is what Ruby is this year. So if you're looking for trends, if you're interested in where's the stuff where, like, there's lots happening, nothing comes close to Ruby. Some of this is probably the Rails books that are built into it. But uh, it certainly has been a, a, a phenomenon. And uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to do a quick demo here. You know, it's the ubiquitous Hello World example. And this will actually give me a little chance to, uh, I told Mike, Mike Krukenberg is here, and it turns out that we're neighbors. Uh, Mike, had, he wrote the book. Mike, you want to plug for your book? Give a plug for your book. How many people have Mike's book? Well, what? Well, Pro MySQL, J Pipes and Mys and MySQL, and Mike Krugenberg um, wrote it together. Um, J Pipes spoke here last year, or sometime this year. So I was telling I was telling Mike we, we met actually after PHP was it PHP meeting in Boston? It's funny we we, uh, we didn't even realize like we lived in the same neighborhood, but we were taking the tea home from downtown Boston, and I had like a SQL Light book, you know, which wasn't my SQL, which was probably in the my first mistake, but he was, uh, he was pretty forgiving about it. And, uh, and so I was telling him that I just, you know, this was literally down the wire to kind of pull this together. There's a lot of stuff going on here. This is a Windows machine. Um, I've got a MySQL server running on it. I've got the, all the Ruby stuff running on it. I've got all the Rails stuff running on it. You too could do this just as easily. Some people in the room have already done it. So, you know, jump in and, and shout out if it's, uh, how many people have installed Rails on their machine? On a scale of you know one to ten, where one is is really hard and ten is really easy, what would you give it? It was awful. It was awful. Okay, we got what platform do you want? I put it in Windows last night, and it took me a bunch of iterations because I already had a patchy on the machine. Yeah. I had a bunch of stuff that was interfering with it. Okay. And every time I would follow directions to the T, something was going on. Yeah. And I started a different package, and I finally got instant rails. Going. You start. You finally got what? Instant rails. Instant rails. It's just a package. It, so you got that up and running? I got it up and running. Okay. Cookbook application. Great. So she was a one, but the lesson from that is get rid of Apache. Okay. So that's lesson one. <laughs> 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 Can we just throw on there. Can we just throw a strong state. Lesson, lesson two. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I had to do was get rid of a register key that Zen had put in that said that Apache's PHP INI was in a different place than the Rails one. That was the last. So this needs a different web server than Apache? Lesson two, get rid of Zen, but no, sorry. Uh, Did you say this needs a different web server than Apache to run? It, 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 has, it has an open source, uh, Ruby actually has its own web server built in, and that's sort of adequate for most demonstration purposes. So, you, although you could do it with, that was, you know, no diss on Apache, obviously it's a great product, but, it, but it, I know at least one other person who has had sort of endured um, conflicts uh, with it. Just a question, was, was it? <laughs> Was it as simply as changing the thing in the registry, or was that the final that the thing final you had hurdle. to do? I actually tried to install a bunch of different packages, and they all failed at some point or another. And yeah. Not having a reference to turn back to and say, this is what I know should happen, because yeah. I've never done it successfully before. I didn't know if it was me, the machine, the package. Did I misunderstand the instructions? Did the instructions wrong? So I, I floated about a lot on like Wikipedia and, and Ruby on Rails worked out a lot. And what I kept finding was that the answer was that I already had Apache and Linux and <coughs> PHP and all kinds of stuff running on a Windows machine and all of that was probably a lot of the problem but I didn't know it when I was originally troubleshooting. Alright. Okay. But good job getting it going. That was good. Anybody else? I installed it under Linux and it was fairly uh, simple. So more at the 10 end of the spectrum. Okay, lesson three is use Linux. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would agree. I, we run, we run Rails and uh, hook it up to Apache under Linux, and it's, it's generally a breeze. 
So it's, it's a range. You are, you know, t to the credit of the people, lots of people will sort of suffer through this, and I certainly myself did suffer through it. And I lived the, through the Apache Wars myself, and so, but it's, it's pretty impressive actually to get up and running in less than a day, so that's, yeah. that's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. No, it is. It's, it is. Okay, so, <laughs> Yeah. so what we're going to do here is, uh, does anybody use Eclipse? Eclipse okay, so s some people, what's, what's Eclipse do, roughly? Pick it. Pick somebody. Give an answer. Integrated development. Integrated development environment. So, Java based. Anybody use it for anything other than Ruby? Python. Does anybody use Python? Python. Use it for Java. And Java. When, okay. When you say it's an integrated development environment, what is it integrated with? What's well, all integrated about it? Well, it has the, the debugger and the source viewer and everything else in the class viewer are all in the same product. Database Explorer. <coughs> yeah. Okay. And at least in the case of of uh, uh, Eclipse, you can add lots of, of plugins into it, so you can add add uh, better database browsers and that sort of thing to it. Subversion. You can compile yeah. on the fly. Okay. Obscure your code. You can see errors as you type titles as you code. Okay. So we just did our whole hello world. I'm sorry, I hope you didn't miss that, but um, it's the you know so the ubiquitous everybody's gonna do hello world, and so this is about as simple as it gets, but. Um, so what we have is the ID development environment, which is it's open source, right? So it's free. You can download it, and then there is uh, a plugin for Ruby. It's called the RDT plugin, the Ruby <coughs> Development Toolkit. And uh, these slides we can make available, and I've got some links to this this stuff as well. Um, but the Ruby Development Toolkit sort of gives you this environment. See, Chris, it's past his bedtime. Well, so I took a risk. I thought I could stay. I want to stay, but I can't. You did good. You did good. Keep it up. We'll see you next time, okay? There you go. The, uh, I'll actually toss this out because it's, it's, this is under the non-disclosure that we're all under. It's the kid leaves. Um, this is actually a phenomenal Ruby uh, development sort of training toolkit that's be, this, this under development. And uh, it's, it's by a guy who's just, you know, sort of one of the geniuses of, of Ruby. And uh, it's geared towards people sort of in the high school age range. And he's calling it presently Hackity Hack. I don't know what it'll come out to be. But, <laughs> but it's, it's uh, and then he's got another one for, you know, kids more that age. Uh, Hippity Hop is what he's calling it. And I've had two of my kids uh, using it. And he's got about 50 people who are sort of involved in uh, an alpha program. Uh, the guy who's developing it, 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 he goes by the, the name of Why the Lucky Stiff. People, people who, who know, uh, who know Ruby's know this Why the Lucky Stiff. It's just uh, like an unbelievable technical wizard. I, I have no idea if he's really just one person or 12, but the stuff that he gets done is very amazing. And so I expect it'll come out in some short period of time. So for people who haven't done Ruby, this would definitely be a great way to sort of uh, get into the language in, in a nice way. So keep your eye out for that. But what we have here, so this is, this is the Eclipse IDE. Over here are sort of all our files on the disk. And these folders, are they basically correspond to folders on the disk. And for me, I'm just using it for Ruby and Rails, okay? And there's a plug-in, and it, I use it in its very simplest forms, which is a, a, a file browser, a, a program runner, and, um, you know, somewhat of a debugging environment for both Ruby and Rails, and we'll see more examples of that. But pre there's another one that comes natively with Ruby, and uh, uh, the developers behind it are great, but I, I actually ran into bugs when I was doing some XML stuff, so I switched over to this. So what, what's your setup to, to run Ruby? I mean, are you, are you hosting it inside IIS or Apache? Or? So what, what we'll see here is that uh, there, are, there are two main free open source uh, servers, web servers that come with, uh, well, uh, Ruby has its own web record, okay? So it's like a free line program to create a web server in Ruby called Webrick. It's just, it's one of the libraries and it kind of gives you that functionality. And when you're doing Rails, when I'm doing at least sort of, you know, interactive <coughs> debugging with Rails, I, I found out that's the easiest thing to do. I mean, I do it on Windows. I have a Linux server, right? And so, I, you know, I could do that. I've got DreamHost, but I actually haven't taken the time yet to set that up as an external thing. So from a developer perspective, I basically use Webrick. Mongrel is another web server, like, you know, akin to Apache, right? It's just, uh, it's a different installable entity. What are other people using for local development? You're doing it against Linux, right? You're doing Linux servers, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, does the Mac, anybody doing it on a Mac? I'm just using the WebRick. 
the web, which comes, which runs on the Mac, right? And it's sort of integrated. What are you using for a development environment? Are you using like TextMate for doing the? TextMate. So TextMate. Yeah. TextMate is a very popular Macintosh uh, text editor, which the developers behind Ruby on Rails uh, use. It's not open source, it, but it's not hugely expensive, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's around $40. So it's like under, under 100 bucks. And it's, it's pretty fun. I don't know if anybody has ever, if you go to the Ruby on Rails website, you'll see um, like the development team behind Ruby on Rails. And they're all Mac fanatics, you know. And so they, they've got like a five minute video clip on Apple's website. And all you see is like a black screen with white characters on it. So, you know, you get this, this lush Macintosh and uh, it's, it's all text. But they swear by the Mac. So the Hello World, all we did was we just put up a, uh, you know, a little printout, basically that prints it out and you can do all sorts of other wonderful things with it. These are, um, I'll show you this because this is, this ran when I, when I left home and this will sort of be a test of, uh, of how well it survived. This is a, a little bit more involved application and we could really kind of dig into this uh, if anybody's interested but it goes out to Yahoo and it, and it grabs some finance information and it pulls it down, it parses it out, it does some computational stuff. Here are some like standard portfolios that, you know, all I'm doing here, all this stuff could be and will be someday built into uh, MySQL. Uh, but presently what uh, I've got just like test data in, in the application, okay? So we're setting up portfolios here, what their allocations are. Uh, you know, you can put comments in, the pound sign is a comment. So it's got, it's got really nice development. Here's, you know, you know basically a, uh, I mean, I guess we're like the, the typeless, so date is, is, an, is a class library, basically. We're creating a new object off of that. We're sort of starting it out with these dates. And we're going to, uh, the variable that we're going to stuff it into is that start date thing. If, if I had to write that in C, it would have been like, you know, at least a few more lines of code, wouldn't you think? But it's kind of a one-liner. It figures out that this is a date. It knows how to handle it. And then you can do things like start date plus five. And it adds five days to it. If you had to do that in other languages, you'd be talking a lot more code. So one of the things that is really significant and why I think people who are interested in MySQL uh, might be interested in Ruby and Rails, it's, it's a hugely productive language and environment to work in. You can prototype stuff very quickly. You can get stuff, you know, sort of at least mock it up and get it out without a whole lot of effort. Uh, and then, so it goes through a bunch of different stuff. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to run this thing called Test Analytics. And it's going to run through a whole bunch of code. And we'll see how it actually works. And then what all it's doing now is, because it's, you know, kind of a self-contained environment, uh, this, this little red dot here says that it's running, okay? And it's, what it's done is it's gone out and it's grabbed, like, the latest interest rates, and it's just pumping this, and it's doing a lot of computations in here. So it's actually gone out to the web, pulled stuff down from the web, parsed it out, and in here somewhere there's a thing where it goes to it, uh, downloads CSV files. Which and have people work with CSV in MySQL? I've I've heard told that it's like about the only way you can efficiently. It's okay. <coughs> it works. Yeah, it works pretty well. There's a way to get data in and out. Actually, we uh, actually I did work with one company. We drag a lot of uh, email data, so through the uh, through the web, so it worked pretty well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is CSV? Commas. Commas are random values. Yeah. Like it doesn't have to be commas. Yeah, it's like it's like a document that Excel would use, for example. Hmm. Okay. But that's where it sort of started out. It also has no standard on what it actually yeah. is. So. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, yeah, it's characters maybe, yeah. It's 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 it was originally comma, but it's 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 actually comma, but it's, it, is, it doesn't have to be comma. It's a mill substitute. It's, it's, it's a, you know, value, 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 with some kind of separator between them. And then, and then the, usually, and usually the first line of the file is the sort of format of, of what the file is, what you would expect with it, like it's headings. So it's a, it's a handy data image format that it, you know is a precursor to it was sort of somewhere between VisiCalc and you know the more modern uh, XML stuff and it was uh, but here just to get a sense of the kinds of things that you know you can do with Ruby and in turn this is kind of a lead into Rails because all of this formatting stuff and the beauty of Rails is that it's written in Ruby and so anything that you write in Ruby you basically can hook in to your Rails environment and this is really beautiful if anybody struggled with PHP uh, it, you know, it's, they, they, my last impression was they were trying to move it more towards an object-oriented programming environment, right? Um, you kind of get that out of the box with here. So, anyways, all we've done is, I mean, you know, this literally does 
thousands and thousands of computations. Okay, this and it's it's probably gone out and it's pulled down thousands of bits of data. Uh, so you can kind of grab stuff off of these websites again using a library that sort of knows how to walk HTML documents. So you'll see at the end one of the things that that I found really enjoyable about this is that you're forced to learn about some of these other related technologies, whether it's HTML or whether it's uh, you know server types of technologies. It uh, it keeps you going. Okay, so so we we did the hello world thing and we did a more involved application. This application it pulls in uh, you know it pulls in sort of routines and and class definitions and things like that from here. So you you start to see some structure of how these things hang together. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, we, we get, kind of get past that with, without crashing, which is really pretty cool. The uh, Rails. How do Rails come about? So th there's uh, David H Hanneman <coughs> Hansen Heinemer. His DHH is, is sort of the creative genius behind this. Um, it's like, it's about as new as new technology can get, yet it really has taken the market by storm. It, he, they were working a small group of five people doing uh, basically consulting projects for companies. And they decided that they really wanted to uh, morph from a consulting organization into a product-driven organization. And so as they started, to, and he was brought in around that time, may have been the fifth employee or whatever for this small consulting group. And he looked at all the different code stuff that they had around and, and tried to basically factor out how they, could, how they could develop a platform from this. And so um, he started to identify different chunks of code, just good development discipline, and, and from that, really, is that's what gave birth to Rails. Uh, one of the, so it launched in July 2004, a couple years ago, right? Version 1.2 shipped uh, just this past year. Does, you know, a, it's a lot of bug fixes, a lot of new stuff. It's very, it's solid. I mean, it's a solid platform that you can work with really reliably. I'll show you some websites and things that are out there today. Um, the big thing about this 1.2 release is that they've set it up in such a way that the, the input and the output it's sort of, it, it's, it's um, transparent to whether or not the device is a little Blackberry or a phone or the data is coming in from an XML feed or from a keyboard. So they've done a lot of nice things to sort of uh, isolate that. Big Rails conference in May, I actually heard that it just um, sold out. And this year actually O'Reilly's behind it. So they're kind of, uh, the first couple of years, you know, it started out with like 30 people and then This Happy Coder, if you want to see what Rails can do, this Happy Coder website is uh, just a bunch of different applications that people have developed using Rails. The, the uh, largest one that I'm aware of that's available is this Odeo. I don't know if anybody's heard of Odeo even, but that, you know, they claim millions of MP3 files that are out there. So pretty high-end stuff. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, well, I was going to say, you might not see Amazon running their website on On the other hand, the guy who's behind Jeff Bezos behind Amazon made a, a financial investment in the company. So there's, you know, there's there's something going on there which is kind of interesting. So if there's any doubt about, is this stuff robust enough to build real applications? Yeah. Actually, Amazon does have a Rails-based website called unspun.amazon.com. Interesting. Uh huh. What's it do? Uh, I believe it's. You might want to Google it. I think it's on spun.amazon.com. It's sort of a polling site. Good. How do you spell that? Yeah, it's Unspun. Just as it's Cambridge Mass Lists. So you think they're like figuring out where we're IP in? <laughs> <laughs> How many people are in the room? And it should be interesting. Most famous person who was lost at now. <laughs> <laughs> No surprise there. Um, <laughs> that's good, but uh, so it really is, you know, a good example of how how commercial ven venues are using this stuff for, for real. Some of it is probably experimental. They're probably trying to find out what the limits are. But again, the real attraction is, you know, from my experience, anyways, you can do stuff with the, with a team that's a fraction of the size of what it would take with some some larger development environments. So everybody with me so far? So we kind of we went through Ruby. It's a language, it's a programming language. You can do a lot with it. It's uh, it's you know object oriented. It's fun. Virtually every developer, every developer who you know, one of the things they comment on is it's a fun language to work in. It's a very nice community, and I think that this you know there's a lot of promise. Okay, so we so we showed a demo of how Ruby you know you can do like normal stuff, crunch numbers and all that sort of thing. 
pull stuff. You can also do some some unusual stuff very easily. Pull stuff in off the web, process it, and do that whole bit. And now we're starting to move. We saw what the development environment, the one development environment, the Eclipse IDE looks like. We're going to move into what we've seen, what Rails can you know sort of do, and uh, we'll we'll start to dig into a little bit more of the code. Okay. So the most of libraries essentially for HTML manipula manipulation, whatever it means. There's no like graphics libraries. There is no like networking. It just HTML oh, yeah, manipulation. Yeah. Plenty of libraries. For keep going. Keep going. Yeah. We're still waiting for. I'm still waiting for somebody to sort of stump the librarian here because I mean, it, uh, you know, in terms of what libraries you might want, uh, it's amazing, amazing how many are available. All right. How about a library which would parse street addresses into its pieces? You know, I it's it's Kathy, so you it's can mostly write text tonight. text no. process. You can write tonight. No, no, I can't. That's a hard problem. I don't know. Go to RubyForge.org and look around. <laughs> Well, uh, obviously, the, you know, there's like no AI solution in here, yeah. so we, we can't, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can do that, you know, parsing dates, times, normal stuff that's structured, right? We can't do the impossible, but... No, um, people, no people write those things. They're yeah. They're commercially available, but they are SOB to try to write Yeah, them. yeah. The thing is, if somebody's written one of those in C, it's, it's easy to hook C up to Ruby. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, right. It's, it's really point. easy to do that. It's very easy to do. I have done it, but... It's, uh, so mostly for text processing. Ruby is mostly for text processing, right? Th there are, um, I mean, anything really. You know, there's no reason you couldn't do physics calculations with it. You, you know, it's got all the numerical processing. It's got. But if, if it is slow, it does make is sense. It arbitrary precision. Yes. There we go. <laughs> okay. But no. how does it make sense to have slow language with arbitrary precision? You doing a simple calculation. Okay. Simple calculations don't need. Arbitrary precision. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not aware that it's in the space shuttle quite yet, but uh, it'll be there soon. So, yeah. It's okay. It's it's good, guess good, it's good it's domain, yeah. Right. No question. I think, I think the point is that in here, uh, for instance, we, we talked earlier about the web service, WebRep, mm -hmm. right? It's all written in Ruby. It's, all, it's, it's interpreted. It's high level. A couple of us are using it. It's easy. You don't have these, these conflicts with, you know, external things that you got to bond mm -hmm. Next step up, what they did was they took the low layer stuff that was the most time sensitive, they coded it in C, okay? Above the sort of the covers, it's, it's uh, you know, it's basically Ruby. Below the covers, it's C. So people, who, this is the kind of, people are sort of parceling out, where is the return on investment that I can get? You know, and to write sort of a module or a, a library in C is very doable. But, you know, now you're in an environment where you can do maybe 80% of the application in a truly high level language, like Ruby. And you know, twenty percent. You can write part. You know, even in a class, you can write part of your class in C, part of it in Ruby, and then you know, the part of it in Ruby that is too slow, you can rewrite that in C, and it's pretty easy to hook up. Right, right. One of the other things, and we're going to get, you know, we're going to get to the MySQL stuff. So don't, don't, uh, I don't want to lose you on that stuff. But uh, one of the other activities that somebody is working on is is integrating the DirectX libraries, the graphics libraries from Microsoft. And uh, it's, you know, not that you could write video games in it, but, uh, you know, I don't see any reason why you couldn't write video games in it. I mean, it's really cool to have, and I mean, I've done this, so, uh, you know, I've tried it. You know, you get a bunch of balls bouncing around, and you get them doing sort of a, a sine wave dance, and it just, you know, and before you know it, you get one doing a sine wave dance this way, the other one doing it that way, and you twist it that way, and it looks like a, you know, double helix. And suddenly, people can start to do sort of analytical things that, for the sciences, that I think just would be impossible for, for most people. With Okay, so... Rails. What's it all about? Uh, DHH. He comes at it with a really, you know, it was his, it was his vision to develop something, and he definitely has his imprints on what this environment is supposed to be like. Strongly opinionated. Probably not unlike Linus Torvalds with with Linux. The same thing. He's, you know, there's a small group of committers, four or five people, who sort of can commit code to the Rails environment, and DHH is at the center of it. Again, not unlike Linux. Uh, don't repeat yourself. They've done a lot of stuff to make it so that you basically define things in one place and you keep going back there. You don't have code sprinkled all over the place. Convention over configuration. They've done a lot of stuff in the way that the Rails environment works, which we'll see with the data models, okay? That uh, it takes the database name. It sort of adds a pluralization to it. it. You know, the singular means that it refers to perhaps the tables. The plural means that it refers to the class. And as long as you adhere to those conventions, then you don't have to write any other code to go in and to retrieve, for instance, columns from a table. As long as you adhere to those conventions, it works. You can, if you want, if you need, either because of legacy systems or because of a personal preference, you can go in and you can change those conventions. 
But by doing so, you start to move away from the benefits of having a platform that is sort of, you know, proven, tested, in wide use, and uh, well documented as well. The model view controller pattern, do people, are people familiar with this? Uh, it's, you know, sort of an age old, uh, you want to describe it? Um, basically, uh uh, three points of a triangle model being the, the database, the data itself, the view is uh, the presentation, and the controller being the um, uh, business, logic. business logic. Yeah. Business logic, thank you. That's great. And so that's, you know, that's what it is. And, uh, and with Rails, they've basically modeled the system in this way. And it works really nicely. And so suddenly we've got, you know, the M of MySQL in here. And that's largely in here, okay? So what you've got is you've got the database behind the scenes. You define what the database is. You define what the, and you can either define the way that the, basically the, the columns and, and the fields and all those things are defined using your common MySQL tools, or you actually can do a lot of it from within the Rails environment, which basically boils down to writing some Ruby code. And we'll show you how to do that. Um, but this is where all the, the MySQL magic happens, okay? And then they've written some very simple configuration files that really have nothing more than the database name and the password and sort of, you know, where it lives. And, and that is what makes the connection between the Rails environment and the MySQL environment. You can then go off and live in Ruby and Rails and do most everything that you need without having to go back into MySQL. Uh, the view is what we sort of, you know, what we think of when we see a browser, right? It's like, what's the stuff we see and how does it get there? And it turns out, and this is where it gets a little bit, you know, where do you draw the line? But this line is pretty clear kind of database stuff, right? This line, the view and the controller, what's business logic versus, you know, uh, what's in the view? The view actually has lots of helper files. You can do formatting stuff, you know, if you want to throw percents up there, you want to do computations, or uh, you even want to pull data in. You actually can do that within the view. Uh, but, you know, the controller, is, it's just, it's pure code. It's the number crunching, it's the data gathering, it's the data manipulation, it all goes there. And, you know, over time, people no doubt get uh, pretty good at sort of factoring where they want to put the code. Scaffolding, which is another big idea. Uh, Mike, can, can uh, if he wants to chime in about the 10-minute video, uh, would you be so kind? Um, so DHH, at some point, a couple of years ago, this is really when I thought Ruby on Rails took off. He did this 10-minute video, which got circulated around a lot of places. And um, it's essentially a video of the files, you know, being edited and him building this, I think it's a weblog application that he built, and he's talking along with it very quickly. And it's amazing how in just 10 minutes, I think it's about 10 minutes, the video, how he goes from nothing to having a pretty, you know, full-featured weblog where you can make entries, you can save, update data, and you have a, a view of this. Um, and just to think about having that happen in 10 minutes, and it really struck me when I watched the video that in, 10 minutes, he went from nothing to this, you know, application. And it's really a working application. Yeah, questions? Is that video uh, commonly available? On the yeah, if you go to the Ruby on Rails website, they have a section that has, and they've added a lot more to it now, but it's, you know, one of the original. I think it's right there on the left-hand side where it says, get excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got excited yeah, when so I watched that. It worked. Creating a web mm -hmm. There we go. We can run it in the background. Good job. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you can, it's, it's too fast to follow along with, but if you pause your browser, then you can actually do it. You know, if you pause the oh, it's just the weblog. So certainly more than one of us has, has sort of built our first, you know, weblog to, uh, you know, to the tune of DHH, and, you know, keying away this thing in 10 minutes time. It really is pretty impressive. Um, and the reason that kind of ties in with the scaffolding is because what they do, one of the ways they can do this in 10 minutes time, is, you know, he's got the database defined, right? He's got a couple of uh, columns defined. You sort of know what the names are, right? And if you follow these conventions, it just all the magic happens. The scaffolding, uh, amongst other things, they have these meta programmers, basically, meta, meta program generation utilities. And what they do is they create the scaffolding that allows you to do things like all of the, the, the CRUD operations, you're kind of familiar with that, the create, you know, replace, update, delete of, um, of database heaven is, uh, you know, it's all built into the scaffolding. So you get a working application that allows you to do, you know, you can add records, you can delete records, you can edit the stuff that is there magically, really, without writing any code. And we talked about WebBrick before, which is that, you know, part of this environment is that you basically have built-in uh, web servers and things like that. But perhaps the, you know, the greatest magic of all 
is is active record. And it's um, so, so here's just you know I have some sample examples to try and connect what the code looks like in Ruby with what the code looks like in in uh, MySQL. And I grab these off of Wikipedia so that um, uh, we won't have any run. Well, I won't say that. But, uh, so, so basically, you know, you have this object, right? Part new, and it's got it's got a field new. Uh, you're going to assign a name, which is the sample of part and the price, okay? And it, essentially, it's the equivalent of inserting values into a database, okay? So here it's Ruby. Here is my SQL. Could, could you separate chicken and egg stuff? Did you actually create your database using this code, or did you create it and then have the code read it and now you're never running? It, that's actually that's a great great question. Um, you can you can do both. Okay, so the chicken and the egg. You could you could typically what I do what I've done is I've created the, the database using the MySQL you know administration tools. Okay, with uh, so the database name and the tables and the fields, right? And that's sort of the way the books go. And then you can sort of um, enter in data if you want sample data to kind of get going. Then you go over into Rails, and we'll see the the, uh, the model and how it works. Uh, and if you want to add columns to it, if you want to change what the columns look like, generally the, you do that within the Rails environments. And they actually have a very nice mechanism for adding and then rolling back if necessary so that you can kind of recreate where you came from, the steps you came from. Mm -hmm. uh, other people, how do other people do it? So for me it's been a blend. I create the database outside in the Windows environments and then I sort of build it within the application itself. How about if I have a uh, field in my table which is saved? That cause conflict in the, uh, the syntax there. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, there's there's a there's a bunch of column names that uh, will conflict if you use Rails. Um, I think if you Google around, you'll be able to find you'll be able to find them. Um, there's a couple of really nasty ones, like if you have a column named Exit, I think that'll actually, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> that'll actually cause you some really serious problems because I think it can actually get you to leave the root interpreter. Um, but there's a list of well-known uh, column names that you should avoid, and uh, and I think they're working in the Rails team to try to, to, try to, to, try to, to fix that. Yeah. Yeah. What, about I, what about ID? Because ID is definitely a, res a reserve method name in uh, Ruby, but it's also a common name for a column. Yeah. Well, ID is the primary. I, ID is generally what uh, Rails out of the box active record okay, uh, so assumes is your primary key so column. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I, ID is what it expects as a okay. call. I wanted to ask actually about the assignment of primary keys yeah. in this framework. Um, if you want to assign one's own primary keys and or more complicated keys, can you make compound um, keys using? Uh, I'm just wondering. I, I'm actually shopping for a framework that I can use with MySQL. Price is right on this one. But how, you want to give it, or somebody else? How sophisticated else? this relationship model is? Yeah. Well. Um, out of the box, uh, Active Record, which is the, the model portion of Rails, assumes that you will use just an integer primary key named ID that's auto incrementing in MySQL. Um, I believe in the Rails framework, I haven't had to deviate from it too much, but you can assign uh, any sort of key field you want to to it, and that you can um, you know assign keys on your own and go from there. Rails out of the box does not support composite keys. Um, and David Hennemeyer Henson is like vehemently opposed yeah, right, to it. Right. And when people ask him about it, he responds generally in expletives. That's composite core keys or composite primary keys? Or composite either? primary keys. Um, probably the same with foreign keys. Now, there are plugins to Rails. Rails has a plugin structure that will allow you to use um, composite primary keys, but it's not part of the core part of Rails, and I don't see it ever being well. David Hennemeyer Henson is alive and contributing to Rails. <laughs> How well does Rails support views? I've had no problem using my SQL views on Rails. I haven't tried to do it. The, the only, from my experience, I've only used uh, views to query from for read-only data. I haven't tried insert, using any insertable views, so your mileage may vary there. But mm -hmm. from, from what I can tell, uh, you know, as long as they have an ID column and you, know, you kind of treat them with the standard Rails conventions, they seem to work just fine. So does this work with any database, or does does there have to be some kind of a? Um, I mean, I'm familiar with ODBC and JDBC. What is the what is the thing that the database provides that's sort of the driver to interface between the database and, and this environment, so that you can do this? Um, if you replace MySQL with Postgres, 
Are you going to change right. a lot of code? No. no what, is is it, what is it using an underlying uh, mechanism to communicate with the database, so I'm asking? Th there's, a, there's a thin layer, which I, maybe somebody else has delved into, which I haven't, but it basically comes bundled with the Rails environment that talks to a bunch of different kinds of Oracle databases, CSV files. So they must files. be using something like an ODBC driver or a JDBC yeah, driver or some really kind of, something that the vendor provides, because they have ultimately control over how you access the database. The, Yes, so so Rails, if you look at it, has a very generic abstract connection adapter that has a set of methods that they require that you implement, and then everybody sort of brings their own access. So if you look, like the MySQL driver, you have a couple of choices. There's a, a pure Ruby driver where somebody went and implemented, you know, just talking to MySQL just over Ruby, and then some people took the native C libraries and compiled that in. Okay. Um, Postgres, you can use, there's there's the same thing. There's a pure, po pure Ruby Postgres driver. There's a pure, there's a C version of the of the Postgres. But, but you do have to have a driver provided by either yeah, the database vendor or Ruby. It, exactly. Typically, people typically the path that people take is they take a native driver, normally you know a DLL or a shared library okay. on a Unix platform. They wrap it in Ruby, and then there's a small interface that you implement in the Rails code. It's like an abstract uh, connection provider or connection adapter or something. But it's like not that. specifically ODBC or JDBC. No, so no, I don't think more likely a native driver. Exactly. I don't think Ruby really has a has a standard like um, like Java has JDBC. I think Perl has DBI. I don't think yeah. things have coalesced that well in the Ruby community. I think there is a Ruby DBI, but I don't think that that it's really coalesced around that. I was going to ask how this how Active Record deals with joins, but I'm probably getting ahead of you. Anybody else is interested in taking it? Feel free. You definitely ahead of me, but that's okay. Okay. Well, I mean, do you get to join later? I don't know. Not this. You, you can you can do joins with Active Record. Um, I mean, well, like, what kind of joins do you want to do? I mean, just sort of like it's a database, so I don't know what you want to do with databases, join things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, it supports all sorts of. Um, I don't know if you talk about has many relationships or many to many or. You can talk about it and I'll refer to it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, so I mean, there's those sorts of things. You can do more advanced joins. Um, okay. And there's all sorts of syntax. Does it basically support. look at your database and understand all the foreign keys by introspecting it? There's a, there's a convention for, for understanding foreign keys. So if you have, um, so let's say you have, uh, uh, you know, a, a person and you want to refer to a person, it assumes that the foreign key to it would be person underscore ID. Okay. And then and then it, you can say, you know, this record has one person. Right. And then you can just call person on the object and it'll go and fetch that relationship. So if I want to generate the equivalent of, you know, select select person where company ID equals, you know, whatever and you know, and company type is such and such. It, Active Record can do that for you without you having to write any SQL. Exactly. You you would you could say person and you could say person has one company or belongs right. to company, and then yeah. you could you could do exactly that. You can say uh, actually what you would do is when you you'll probably get into this later, but you would say person dot find, yeah. and that'll let you find a particular person, and then you can say include company, okay. which will then join that in and and uh, and do an eager load. Um, that's so that's yeah, actually, I'm sorry. That's actually the beauty of it. Is it you can do simple. Um, okay. think so yeah. 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 The problem is so big, right? For example, if I select so many mm -hmm. a million records from that, how how will be handled? Um, I don't mean to, to take over. No, you're doing good. You're doing good. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the, so you could do that, and you could it'll probably blow out your your interpreter. But <laughs> there's in the find there, you can see there's conditions there, and one of them you can say is limit and offset, right, and so it'll be the it traditional you know things that okay. you would do with MySQL, where you can say you know limit ten, offset zero, and and then page through results as you as you normally would. So so you could do that just as easily in Rails, and they pr they even provide uh, code out of the box to let you paginate results. That, yeah, that's great, very helpful. Thanks, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, in addition, you can feed in. SQL statements directly into your active record queries, in essence, you can embed them in. So if there, if you, if there isn't the, quite the right stuff that you want, then uh, you actually can sort of overcome that just by kind of going native without too much difficulty. Um, this was actually a little bit along the lines of, you know, sort of, you know, the find and giving a sense of what it looks like at kind of at the higher level versus what the equivalent w might be in MySQL. But again, you can basically take this, plop it right into one of these, uh, these Ruby calls and effectively get the same results. Is it like prepare statement on the f uh, on the top? Name equals 
question mark? Yeah, right, right. What we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll talk about, like this is an array, okay? And uh, the way this is set up is that, you know, th there's a lot of hashes that are used within Ruby and within Rails mm -hmm. so that um, it, it's, you know, these are actually equivalent. And that might take some thought, right? You know, how do you go from this to this and you actually get the same results? And I'll show you an example later on where, in fact, you know, uh, and, and I'll give it away right now, but I had put these in because that's sort of the way that the documentation said to do it, you know? And I was pulling my hair out. It was on a, a SQL query. And uh, it wasn't getting the right stuff, and it turned out that it was a bug is in, in the software. But um, here, we were talking a little bit earlier about how you connect the connectors, the database, or, or rails to the underlying databases. And it's really this simple, you know? The, the, uh, again, one of the, these architectural preferences for the way people should develop in rails is they should have uh, a development environment uh, which is, you know, you kind of work in the code yourself, a test environment, which is maybe a group of people, and now you're in production. Each of those should have different uh, databases that you're working off of, and each of those databases could be created using these so-called migrations, where you essentially add columns and define the databases as you go. Uh, but for the most part, this is really the only connection that you do as a, this is the only connection I've done, let's put it that way, in, uh, at least in using MySQL, okay? And, and, but again, if you go to Oracle's website, you'll see that they've got like a page on what it takes to kind of tune your connections from Ruby to uh, Oracle. The other thing that we should mention, even though we're kind of we're now in the Rails section of this this discussion, uh, there's an Active Record that also works with Ruby. So what they did was they basically extracted out the Active Record functionality, and you can use it outside of Rails with just Ruby. So if somebody had sort of a desktop application where they didn't want all the Rails superstructure, you can do that as well. Uh, we we kind of showed a little bit of this in the application, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, here's the application I'm going to get to eventually, Dave Dashboard. This is the thing that I developed here. Uh, these are the folders, the, the directory structure. So app, it holds all the code for this app. Within app, you've got these, it basically it's the model view controller, the MVC structure, controllers, the helpers don't quite fit the MVC, but the, we talked about the helpers in terms of uh, functionality that you can call out from views and so forth. That's where you put those scripts or those routines. Uh, models, we talked about how you define, and we'll spend a few minutes on that, uh, and views, which is what this the, the stuff looks like that gets put up on the web. Here is a, you know, a convention. The convention is, this is what your directory structure looks like. You can mess around this, you can move controllers down here, you can put the DB stuff up there, you could, but you know what, it's not going to work. So uh, if you want to do it, if you've got a good reason to do it, then th the flip side of it is hire a few more people to really make it effective. Uh, but along with that 15, 10 minute introduction, one of the things that the scaffolding does, one of the things that this Rails script does to get, when, when you did the instant Rails, it created this structure for you. It put the basically stubs, little stubs of application in the right place. And they're smart stubs in the sense that if you don't sort of fill them out and it's a view stub, it'll come up on the screen and it'll say, you know, I'm the view stub. You can find me in this directory. So it kind of, you know, to a certain, does a very good job of leading you by the hand through these examples. Um, the other thing we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, all the different ways that you can connect with databases and, and things, I very much have taken the approach of, Get a book, there are good books, there, there are good examples, step through it. Step through the 10 minute video, really follow in detail. One of the things that you know is somewhat questionable about the open source space, documentation uh, is, is sometimes not the most precise. It might be a version out of date. It's, you know, it might be written by three different people. So it can be kind of hard to come by. Ruby is exceptional in the way in Rails, that they've got lots of great, um, lots of great books out. These things here that it, it's the file name, okay, the boot, uh, the database, example database, YAML, uh, yet another markup language is what that YML stands for. These times here, which I kind of chopped off uh, because they're kind of late or early, but it's, it's um, the source code control that you can do as well using SVN, which is another open source product for, so you actually can have multiple developers working on things like this if you want. Uh, brief description of, listen, we talked about views. We talked about the, let's, we'll take a look at the database schema actually and how that sort of works. Um, so let's, we're going to go into another demo now. And here we have, we're back in Eclipse, okay. What I'm going to do here in the upper right hand corner is I'm going to switch to a slightly different view. 
of how this is arranged. It's not hugely different, but uh, this is, uh, it's a Rails view, okay? So you've got just different windows, and, and uh, just to go across the bottom tabs, uh, here are a bunch of servers that I have. Basically, every application has its own server. Uh, the generators, these are the things which we're not going to get into, but these are the things that create the scaffolding for you. Rake is Ruby's version of Make. It's Ruby Make, and so uh, it's, it's a very useful, powerful tool. Console is when you put stuff out to the console. This is where it comes. I sort of use it heavily for, for um, uh, you know, development, debugging, and stuff like that. Uh, what sort of make are you doing on an on a interpreted language? Yeah, uh, good question. The, the, uh, I'm trying to think what, for instance, the, the only thing. What's that? You may have C stuff that has to be dealt with, right? I guess C? The, the only thing I've used it for is, uh, is building these migrations, these database migrations. So what you have is you've got a definition of what, the, you know, what columns you've got in a database. And then let's say a week later, I add three more columns. And then a week later, I add three more columns. And so when you kind of want to roll all those up, it, you know, that's the extent of what I use it for. Other things that people? Testing. Testing? For, for like automated testing or yeah. running scripts and, and inventories of tests? And is it as complex as make? Is it uh, is rake as complex as make? I, I I don't know. I mean, I heard an audio of the guys who developed it, and they basically took <coughs> make as the model and they ported it in Ruby. They they weren't sure they could do it, but they magically did. Anybody else rake? know? Do you have a rake file yourself or not? No, no. I'm not sure why. It's, I I guess I built it on a different machine. I would. Oh. Uh, well, you'll have a rake file in oh. Rails app. You know what? What I didn't. I think maybe what I have to do is select a server. Would that be possible? So well, here. Going to your Rails app, I think. Uh, I'm trying to remember where yeah, there we, I, I didn't have any, any uh, Rails projects on the left-hand side selected so that it didn't quite know what to, what to do. But a generator, here we, here's how you generate controllers, migrations, models. These are all basically the components of, uh, of Rails. And here's we, the rake tasks that we talked about. The only thing I've used it for is migrate. And I just had to key it in. I, I don't, there, there was no pop-up for that. Um, Hit the refresh, it'll do it. In the hit the refresh here. No, on the right hand side. Right, right there. I'll try to update rake tasks. Mm -hmm. Now, now go back to the drop down. Oh, uh, no. I maybe I don't have I didn't have any tasks. Whatever I've done, I've just done manually. So I apologize I for that. But there might be. Uh, I I know it copies a rake file to your to your Rails app. I think if you look in, I think it's the scripts directory. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's right there, right there. Uh, oh, yeah, right there? Okay, so what do we do if we... Should we open yeah, this? Double -click it. So require <laughs> rate... <laughs> no, it's simple. Yeah. I made this for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, check, check under lib, too. It might be under lib or it might be under config, but you'll see it. There you go. Uh, no, check config. Oh, check config. You got me not. It's okay. It's okay. Environment source. Um, I get it. Yeah, that looks like a dummy rake file with nothing in it. So the, the good news is that you know, even I, not knowing how these things work, you actually get something to work, mm -hmm. um, and you can too. So, th th so basically, again, we saw how the controllers are set up. We saw how you can generate code. The thing is, you can do this right from the DOS prompt or from a you know a console. You don't have to do it within the Rails or within the IDE itself. Uh, okay. So as far as the demo goes, what we're going to do is we go in here and we're going to click on that. You notice that the status of the server is stopped, okay? Uh, we're going to do two in one. We're going to actually launch the browser. It notice that there's no server running. So let's start that up. Well, that's starting up. Let's go into the models because this is where we start to get into a little bit of uh, this application. It's got two, two data models, basically. And so, th so the server is now running. Okay, so we've got essentially our substitute for Apache, uh, which is this web brick server that's running. But let's look briefly at uh, th my definition of my customer database. Okay, so uh, these basically what what Rails gave me was I pointed it to where the database was. It knew uh, that it's basically a customer database, 
and that it's inheriting, that's what that little bracket says, the, the left arrow, from active record. So it's all object oriented. So active record is the thing that has all this understanding of how to pull stuff out of the database, how to pull the columns, how to pick, pull the names, and so forth. And these other things, uh, access reportable and access managed report, are just sort of attributes that I have added onto it, which allows me to do easier reporting off of it. Uh, in the stock database, which has a little bit more going on in it, because what I've done is it's, it's uh, you know, we talked about sort of these helper functions. So what I have here is I have something that just is going to convert numbers to currency. Okay, I needed some place to put it. The place I put it was in essentially the stock data table object. Again, it's inherent, but this is all I needed to do to talk to the underlying database. What, what is def? Is that a method? What's that? Define. Define, Define the method. Defining a method. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. And begin and rescue? What are those? That's like throwing, that's Both like uh, catch in right. Java. Try mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Okay. Just, we probably just called that here, but try and catch it. But when you rescue, you're, you're that, that's basically saying risk, that's basically saying catch anything. Well, well, then is that a function or a variable? That's your return value, it looks like. So you're just saying ignore errors? That's, looks like it. On error return, number. yeah. Return number. <laughs> um, I, it looks like it, yeah. Return what you passed in. The last expression in, in a Ruby method is what's returned from it. Okay. And then, uh, where are the migrations? DB, there we go. Um, the other thing, because, you know, this is sort of another, okay, so this is how the creation of my, so I start, I basically created the database, all right? This is where, uh, you know, we saw the YAML file, which basically points to the database and tells you what kind it is, right? Uh, this file, the migration file, is where I basically define what these columns are, okay? And what this says is that when you're, the self up is that this object, and I'm upgrading it, basically, or, or you know, I'm moving to the next revision, next version of it. Add in all these columns and define them as strings. And, and the, actually, the, we talked about the typeless language, but in fact, when it comes to the database, that's the one place I think that you do define types. And it's so, somewhat limited. It's sort of a subset of what MySQL my offers. Mm -hmm. uh, and force, like force is, is what? Uh, it's like a default. So it's 50 characters or something. Yeah, force, force yes. means drop the table if it exists. Oh. Uh, thank you. Okay. Hmm. And as far as the, the, the string, uh, there are two types of like this, string and text, and they're different lengths, right? What's yeah, and you, and you can actually, at the end of that, you can say uh, limit. You can you can say limit and pass it in the, the length of the string to assign it to whatever you would want to set the string length to. Was there a generator to read your table schema and turn it into that code? That, yeah, that actually, really the schema RB file right below it does that. Okay. So you can create a schema and then say, this is what I already have. I'd like to build a Ruby on Rails interface for this data that I've collected. Mm -hmm. <coughs> How can you specify the engine the table is going to use? Uh, you, you can do that um, if you go back to the version <coughs> where it said at the top uh, force equals true. That's actually a, a hash of the options. So there, you can actually pass in an options parameter where you can specify the storage engine, uh, collation, or whatever, or character set, or whatever else you would need to do. Because by default, it creates NODB tables. How do you specify things like foreign keys and index and unique key and the like? There's an add index method. There's no foreign key support out of the box. What? Oh. Well, can I say it again? Rails has no foreign key support. Not out of the box, no. Mm. You can add it, but it's not there out of the box. But uh, it uses in the DB, you said. Yes. Why yeah. shouldn't? Why it doesn't use my son in this case? Why doesn't it? Um, I think they wanted to. Because the it will be kind of. Uh, I think it doesn't use my ISIM because there there's functionality in Rails to support transactions. So you can actually conduct transactions on a series of objects. And so I, I believe it wants to leverage the transaction support in ODB. You said out of the box it has no foreign key support. So what is it you have to add to it to get foreign key support? There's a Rails plugin that you can, Rails has a, a plugin system that allows you to add functionality. Um, and you can add in functionality that lets you that lets you assign foreign keys. Except as soon as you have more than one table, you're going to want that. <laughs> Some people like to just run without. Yeah, you can do that. So like living dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so here's, uh, here, here's another migration. So we've kind of, you know, basically what happens when you run the rake 
uh, file. It executes all of those and rolls it up and you've got a new version of it. This is, this is sort of the other, uh, the stocks table that I've got. It creates some stocks and uh, this, you know, you've, you've got a little bit more detail in terms of what they defined as. And I'm actually creating some data in here, some test data sort of embedded in this so you can kind of you know, jumpstart things. And then when you do, in essence, the reverse migration, you want to get rid of these tables. Essentially what it does is it goes in when you're moving down, a down migration, it drops the tables to make sure that things are kind of kosher. At some point, uh, these things can get a little bit messy. You know, if you get so many migrations, then, then and, and I forget what they exactly recommend, but you know, you may have to just start fresh with, you've got a schema, that's a good schema, go with that. Or, you know, so at some point it is good to kind of get rid of all this iterative stuff. You get a fresh starting point, you can do more migrations from that up or down, okay? Um, so in the example that they give in, you know, sort of in the book is exactly that. Sit down with the client, you kind of mock something up real quick, it's sort of the 15 minute, look okay, and then you iterate off of that. At some point you get to do a cleanup though. Uh, so we've, we've seen the migrations, we've seen the models, uh, we've seen, we can just take a quick look at one of these controllers, uh, you know, a bunch of code comments. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we've got, you know, s some, uh, there's some session data in here, so you can kind of keep track of things. Um, the, the other thing that you can do is you actually can hand off data between the models, the views, and the controllers. It's sort of a behind the scenes sort of thing, in particular between the controllers and the views. There may be some sort of, you know, pure view of how this stuff should be handled and how it shouldn't, but uh, you can hit, pass things back and forth. One of the things that I was going to, I'll cover it a little bit later, but um, we see the definition for AAR stock report. And this is the uh, access reportable functionality, okay? So this is this stock.report table is, um, the stock is the, basically is the object, okay? And the report table is the functionality that gets built in earlier on in the model. You remember we saw this access reportable line item that we had. What that does is it adds those methods and that functionality into this data object, okay? And then this data object is now able to do things, and I'll show you how it, it shows up in the view. This was like a third-party add-in. It was a plug-in. So you, you kind of require it, you add it in, you slap it on, it adds in the methods and the functionality to that object, and now you can access it. Okay, that's part of Rails or that's part of Rupert? What's that? That's part of Rails or part of Rupert? Uh, th that actually is part of Rupert, right. Would you mind explaining what that stock in the report table even statement says? It's pretty hard to read if you're not a movie programmer. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, so it's it's going to pick up only it's going to pick up uh, you know only these fields these are all different fields uh, columns in the database okay and the methods it's going to use if I'm not mistaken uh, it's going to it's basically going to pick these fields up and it's going to put this data out in an HTML format. So it's going to get it get the current value. Is that right? Crop it and then. My expert. I've never used Rootport, that's why I'm here. Right? It's basically pick, it's picking up these fields, okay, and it's going to it's going to uh, plug it with these values in the format that it's going to output it as is HTML. You might want to explain that what you've got there is basically uh, basically your your call sequence there is is basically uh, key value hash like that 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 equals layer then that's basically uh, key value key value. Thank you. And, yeah, right. and, and the call, the colon things, those are symbols that you're printing with list symbols. Right. Um, those are symbols instead of strings, so they exactly. don't have any number in you. Right, much right. And, so. it, and, and what we've sort of got is we've got this hierarchy of objects where basically, you know, you've got the object, you've got the method, and here's another method here, which is, you know, outputting it as HTML. So it, it kind of, and then what it's going to do is uh, this partial, is the AAR stock report. What that is is actually, the, the partial is uh, a subsection, uh, it's, it's a chunk of HTML code. Can you scroll it back to the left? That looks like you have a, a, a hash key value without anything next to it. Ah, okay, you got a method call. Sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> render is, is the way basically that Rails produces data in the views, okay? It's the way it produces the views. And so, and partial, is the way that you can, basically what you're able to do is you're able to build up your HTML views using sort of sub-chunks of code, okay? And what you do is you specify, and this is where it, it's, you start to push the limit a little bit in terms of the things that you need to really know to become productive, which is suddenly you've got to be a little bit familiar with HTML, okay? Now it's structured, but if you are, you're in good shape. 
So what we have, let's. So what we did a while ago is we we started up the uh, the server, and we'll go back to that right there. Okay. So this is sort of the default page that you get, right? So we've we've defined the databases, we've configured it, uh, you know, we've created these different controllers and stuff like that. To uh, it's it's running off of a local host server, and that's the port 3004. You can have any number of these things running that you want, and. The way this has been set up is that there's a home page, okay? And that, so now you sort of, and these, basically these URLs get fed directly into your Rails code, okay? So the way Rails is working it is it's grabbing the URL and it's going to find a method in essence named home. And it's gonna run that code. And that code is gonna produce a view. And this is a view and it's got a bunch of text down the bottom, but, uh, the basic stuff is, you know, these are live links, okay? So we click on this, and now it's, it just pulls stuff off the MySQL database, all right? So we'll spend more time talking about this than it actually was taken to, to produce this in, in your 10-minute uh, video. Um, but what this did is it went out, and it pulled stuff off of the database. If we want to create a new customer, this is all we have to do. This is scaffolded stuff. So what it does is it basically says, what names do you have as fields, uh, and it gives you you know, some fields to uh, type stuff in. And then you can create it. Is there any kind of data typing being done here? To no, you can, you can do all that, you, you know, obviously all the kind of good error checking and the stuff to prevent HTML injection and all kinds okay. of things. Okay, so if con let's say contact title, instead of being a string with a foreign key to a, a title table, how could Rails, does Rails know what to do with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you can you can handle that. So you can you so could would it, pop, uh, would it pop up a menu of all the possible titles? Would it understand? Yeah, that it's this, not would, quite it, a, would understand this is a foreign key. And I need to look it up somewhere else. Yeah, at some point you do have to write code. Yeah, right. <laughs> but do <laughs> this is sorry to say, but um, on the other hand, for stuff like on the right hand side over here, you don't have to write code. Like this edit stuff to go in and pull these things up and make changes. And again, this is why, you know, for certain class of applications, uh, it's, you know, if you just have beta, you know, basically data crunching and things like that that you want to do. Right. Uh, but I'm really curious how this looks when you've got more than one table and there, there's some relations in them. Yeah, that's good. Hey. Well, we may get there. We, okay. We, we may not, but. Uh, um, so, okay, so we've got that. Let's go back to the home. Uh, we can do obviously the same thing. With you know and here, you're, you might have noticed that the Google, the Cisco, the Yahoo, those were the default uh, fields or, or data records that we put in uh, when we started. And uh, and so this is so you know we've got some data, okay. And now let's let's sort of try and put it into an application of some sort. So we build the databases. We've got the, the ability to update data and you know sort of manipulate. Stuff like that. So here was kind of the culminating step for my journey on a lot of this stuff, which was, okay, how do I make this interactive in a way that I can actually put up data on a screen that, uh, you know, and give people sort of the feeling of an interactive environment to work with, okay? And so this uses some ajax -y kinds of stuff, and, and uh, we'll show you they've got, uh, you know, there are two databases, and there is, this is not bug-free completely. But, uh, as you notice, there are a few extra customer databases. <laughs> uh, but let's see if we can find a stock one and we'll add some more to this. So what we did, you may not be able to see it, but when you uh, load the stock database, it puts in ID symbol down on the left-hand side down here. If we go back and pick one of our, which customer database would you like, it uh, now has populated that little field with the, uh, the column names from, the, from the, uh, that database. Then what you can do is you can do things like, you know, you can drag and drop column names, okay? And uh, then what you can do, once you've done that, is you can actually produce some reports. And so what kind of reports can you produce? Well, it's, uh, you know, there's one. And what it's done is it's pulled out these column names, and it's produced a little mini report with just those column names, okay? And uh, that's what a report does, allowing to manipulate visually on the screen, uh, pulling out the strings, right? This, this is the this Cooper. is the part I did. Okay, so oh, you did. I did this stuff, right? So, and this is you know this is like a, uh, it's it's an open source thing, so anybody can use this 
part of it. But what Rupert has done, that access reportable stuff that we were talking about earlier, it's kind of like that's what it plopped up there, right? The stuff to manipulate these buttons and these column names and drag and drop them over here is code that I wrote. And then I said, okay, what field, what column names are here? Pull them out, plug those into the Rupert viewer, do one of those partials, which is a chunk of code that says basically it's dynamically created. The one thing that I didn't mention is that uh, Ruby has the ability to be embedded in a lot of different things. The same way PHP has, what's the symbol it uses, the, the uh, percent sign or something like that when you're... Yeah. Open bracket percent sign. Open bracket percent sign, right. Ruby has the same sort of thing where you can embed within HTML Ruby code. And that Ruby code can refer to your, your databases, it can refer to your globals, it can refer to a whole bunch of different interesting stuff, right? Um, and so I've got some Ruby code that I wrote that grabs out of these fields, these column names, and then dynamically builds these um, these reports, right? And you could, and I didn't, uh, but you could, you know, uh, build fancy queries with all sorts of linking and, and stuff like that um, in to, to, you know, to your heart's content. The other thing that Rupert does is, so, so that was basically developing uh, on the fly a dynamic report based upon fields that the user chooses, okay? So Amazon could have, you, you know, your own little personalized web page that allows you to pick your favorite, you know, I have a, a, a thing for publication dates. It's like I'm interested in the stuff that's new. I don't really want to see, you know, for, for certain areas, right? On the other hand, if it's classical philosophy, it's kind of like, you know, if it's less than 100 years old, I'm not interested in it. So you could create your own report and, and have some nice uh, visual interface. Now what Rupert does, this reporting scheme and this code in here, which I'll, I'll show you what a Rupert report looks like actually before we, we do it. Uh, it's right here, and this is uh, this is kind of an interesting story. That this is just a simple little report. Okay, this is a report style one. All it's going to do is it's going to take, you know, it's going to take some. Uh, it's, this isn't pulling anything off of any databases. It's just canned data. Okay, Rupert's written by this guy Greg Brown, and I said to him, Greg, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to be able to take any database and in sort of Rails-like fashion be able to have a smart way of keeping track of what databases I have out there at any point in time. In Rails, it turns out you can't do that. If you, if, you know, it's got all this fancy model stuff, but if at any point in time you want to find out what's the scope of all my models that I'm accessing, uh, and maybe you've figured out a way to do it, but you actually can't do that, okay, without, uh, you know, a fair amount of legwork on your own. So this guy wrote a nice little access manager re report, which I put in with every new database that's created. What that gives me is the functionality to, at any point in time, pull up an array of all the databases that are out there, which is really kind of a useful thing to have. Um, so this is the definition. This is a Rupert report, very simple one. It's going to generate a table in HTML format. And I've got this tucked away in my Rails directory. Here's another one, okay? And uh, here's the third one, right? Where, you know, you're generating a little bit more sophisticated stuff. It's got some column names as well as some data. Um, and we'll come back, I think I have it here. Uh, you know, lightweight, they, they emphasize structure more than formatting. You're not going to get tremendously fancy, pretty uh, formatted reports out of Rupert. But you can do all that stuff on your own between Ruby and, and uh, HTML. It's, it's a kind of a version 0.8. It's working on a version 0.9. It's, this was a Google Summer of Code project from last year. It'll probably be finished up by mid-year this year. Uh, and it's got some really nice extensions and a real nice developer community. Here's an example of what the Rupert report might look like. Again, this data, it, it can interface with the typical databases. It can interface with CSVs. It can interface with, but for purposes of this demonstration, we've only got data here, okay? Uh, but different people use it for, you know, you can use it, people use it in hospitals and a whole bunch of different things. Um, we, we won't get into lessons on, on Ruby programming at this point in time, but you basically, with Ruby you can do all the usual stuff, the do loops and the while loops, and you know, you've got blocks of code, and it's fairly intuitive for anybody who's done any programming. Uh, here is the sort of the closing piece of the Rupert report. It's, gonna, it's actually, what it's doing is it's producing an HTML snippet of code. That HTML snippet of code is going to end up back in our application right here. And the place it's going to end up is, I'll show you in just a second, 
So down here we have a, these three different reports, the basic HTML table. And that's, you saw Greg's name and you saw a couple different names there, right? So this is a little bit more of a canned reporting application. Here, one of the other types that it puts out is a text table, okay? Uh, nothing too fancy. Uh, and here's sort of another one. You know, it's kind of numbers, basic bold, and a few different things. But if, again, if sort of the vision, and again, this is version 0.002, not version 2. Uh, where'd, the SVG, where'd the SVG go? Uh, it, the SVG gets, it can also produce PDF output, which is really pretty cool. It can produce SVG uh, output. My sort of dream is to be able to get the SVG so that you can dynamically feed it back into a web browser and have graphing. No, I was just trying to see where did it put it out, where did it put the SVG out on your, on your display? Uh, it, it didn't. Oh. It, it doesn't do that. Okay. Which, which uh, the, the way you get to see it is by going into uh, the directory. Oh. I thought, it, I thought it embedded it. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Unfortunately, it, uh, it, you know, it's not there yet, which is kind of, I think, where we all want it to go. But, uh, but I, actually, I have it as a slide because it doesn't. That's where it puts it. No. <laughs> um, so, so this is actually what you know. You can do basic stuff like the the titles and the colors and you know, simple stuff. SVG is one. Has anybody ever worked with SVG? <laughs> It's a standard that like is like a great great idea, but it seems like it's dying on the vine, unfortunately. It's, it's basically an XML definition of graphics. Yeah, and there's there's some there's some great applications that have been written. Basically, what SVG is is uh, what's it, what's it, the acronym for? Scale vector graphics. Yeah, is that what it is? So so it, you know it's a great way of defining graphics like this in like really tiny files with you know they're not big bit maps or anything like that, and uh, you can produce them on any kind of platform that you want the same way you could XML. But unfortunately the, the browsers handle the stuff very differently or not at all, which is you know somewhat problematic. So everybody's got their but somebody's got to figure out how to do this right because having you know sort of portable graphics would be a beautiful thing to do. Well our wiki just renders all of them all of them on the server side and presents them as PNG files to the to their clients. So it simplifies that a great deal. Yeah. Yeah except that the, it's very costly um, processing wise. They're, well, PNGs don't compress as well as JPEGs, but they do far better than JPGs, and you can have yeah, right, true posts. Would you rather just send a bunch of vectors? If, <laughs> if you can't render them reliably, then no. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> you, should, some you should be able to render them better in the browser than, yeah. Yeah. than the PNG does. But it's yeah. not Firefox not, does... Uh, not always a nice word. <laughs> Firefox does as good a job as anybody, it seems, with the SVG files. But, but right now, so what are the limitations of all this stuff? I mean, I can't do graphs. That's a bummer, you know. Uh, there, there's like this Scruffy. Uh, anybody ever used that? I mean, it's kind of a, an application environment for doing nice, colorful graphics. But it's really complicated. Nobody has ever just talked about how easy it is to install. It's Apache times 100. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to mess around with, and it's heavy. and. So it looks nice, but to actually, so to do integrated graphics, other solutions are, um, you know, Flash, right? What's that new thing from Adobe? Flex. Flex, Flex Flash, another FL, uh, where you can basically do more embedded graphics. The Flash stuff is actually pretty promising. Actually, there is uh, Zia, Z-I-Y-A, is a, a Flash-based graphics charting. Have you used it? Joe yeah. works not badly. It's nice, right? It looks, nice. It looks good. Yeah. It looks good. Yeah. So it's you know a simple way of feeding data, you know, out of a database, out of your application, into a graphing application, and have it pop up as as a little uh, flash component. So we'll wrap it up here, and then any questions? Um, so to get started, you know, somebody did it, and, and we've got testimony that despite <laughs> that it was really painful, but it still took less than a day. It says Linux and Windows, but it works on Mac OS, Mac OS 10 also, right? Uh, yeah, it does. I, I forgot Mac. It's terrible. I cut my teeth on the Mac. I had a 128K Mac. I was, I was there. So, um, But Mac, yeah, it, uh... Yeah, there's a, uh, just like on the Windows, there's an installer that will yeah. do everything called Locomotive. Locomotive. They have different, yeah, they have different names from, from platform to platform, but the, it, it is one of the few, I think, development environments that is truly cross-platform for Ruby and Rails and, uh, And Rupert should work too, because it's all on Windows. So you, you like locomotive install on Windows? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 for Mac. 
for Mac, yeah. for, for people who do Windows, who, what, what do you guys like for, for uh, install? Can anybody install it on Windows? For Ruby? Yeah, with well, the whole package. You have it running. Yeah, I've been running. I mean, that's it's the one-click installer, and then I do a gem install for Rails. The other thing we didn't talk about is that uh, Ruby and consequently Rails has this great updating environment called Gem. Which what's the analog for Linux? There must Yum. be. What is it? Yum. Yum. So it's a way of, of quickly, easily, reliably getting updated files. You know, like RPMs or that type. It's like they're like RPMs, right? So you do like you know Gem, which I don't know what it stands for, but. Um, well, Ruby gem, it yeah. makes, makes sense. But <laughs> gem, gem install or gem uninstall, and then you give it the file name. And I have no clue where they get these. Is it like SourceForge? That they, it, it just it finds the stuff yeah, the for you. The so there's a Ruby for, there's a Ruby for it. It's probably getting somewhere from there. Getting somewhere from there. But it's, that's like transparent. I mean, remarkably so. It it, it, it works nicely. So uh, I, I think we're in. You know, we're living in the lap of luxury here with books. We have some from O'Reilly that they very generously. Have donated. I, I think, um, but they're great books. People should have. If if you're at all serious about this stuff, avail yourself of it. You know, for uh, pick that book off of Amazon. Um, you know, if there's one book you're gonna get, you, you know, you can't go. Or if there's two books you're gonna get, you can't go wrong with those first two books, right? Yep. I, for some reason, I had a hard time finding a book just on Ruby itself. Maybe they're all sold out. Which do you recommend? That first one is basically the Ruby book. Amazon. Okay. Uh, I mean, I want to want to have stuff like that. Have you tried that? No. They're just down the street. Yeah, Amazon, I mean, I've certainly gotten them AmazonBuy.com. In fact, uh, O'Reilly has a deal where if you buy it from them, it's 33% off. So right. we'll give you some book on O'Reilly so. book, isn't it? Uh, you know, I, I some of them are, some of them aren't. Yeah. Uh, actually, O'Reilly distributes, these are the, pro uh, the Pragmatic Programmers Workshop. Books, Programming Ruby, it was the first one out. And basically, they're little, you know, Dave Thomas and his buddies. And uh, O'Reilly now distributes it, the same way that O'Reilly is now hosting the Rails conference yeah. in May. So, um, so, but if you go to Amazon, it, it looks like it's a different publisher. Uh, anyways, programming Ruby is excellent. Another excellent uh, Ruby book is the Ruby Way. You, you, that's from Addison Wesley. Um, Hal Fulton. He, this is a second edition. Both these books are second editions. Actually, this book is also second edition. So it's not even like a first edition. You know, a lot of the titles have been actually. Yeah, you really want the first book because the Ruby Way is a good book, but it, it, it says explicitly this is not a book to learn Ruby from. That's a good point. Yeah, you're right. This is more the Ruby Cookbook is another one of those where if you want like working code that you can just type in and run it, um, it's good. But I, you know, I guess if you were to get two, just based upon the historical evolution of the industry, the first two would be the ones. To get and one is all about Ruby and one is basically all about Rails. Uh, we're going to start with the, the best book at the top, Mike. Right there, you go. Uh, obviously, you know a bunch of my sequel books. We've got some to give away from from uh, O'Reilly, and I, I have referred to a couple of these, and, and I guess I'll get into it. I haven't uh, when I get stuck, you know, in sort of some of the esoterica of, and I I have not been able to. Uh, I couldn't have done any of this stuff without like a, an HTML book, okay? If you've done no HTML, this is probably like a good book. It's one of these head first, you know, it's like HTML for dummies kind of thing, but it's a fun book and uh, lots of good references. And, and of course, Goodman's, you know, it's the Bible of it. Lots of good stuff out on the web. Uh, just got to, you know, it's, it's you're going you're gonna to encounter bugs, you're going to have problems. There are very nice people out there and they're uh, willing to help a remarkable amount. So it wasn't that easy. Um, I had this problem, right? And this is for, you know, the trivia buffs in the group. You know, this was like my SQL worked here. If I just type it in here. You know, if the way the documentation says to do it with uh, Rails is like here. You know, so you can actually embed the, the SQL into your Rails stuff. When I had, I got a little application here where it's like a Rolodex. And, uh, you know, I want to find Joe's name, whether it's in the, the uh, first name or the general topic or the descriptive. It's really hard to do unless you've got like a database that's full text index to find stuff that occurs that may occur in any one of a number of fields. Um, so I thought it should be pretty easy. I wrote some code and and I, you know I built the query and it didn't do it. And so uh, I wrote to the guy who was the, the Rails guy who who wrote the basically the database the active record stuff. And I said this isn't working, you know. And uh, he he got back to me like within an hour. And and uh, he said well. 
the SQL you have is correct, so the problem must lie elsewhere. <laughs> okay, I've been working on this for two days. No, no kidding. <laughs> and so I figured it was, I didn't feel embarrassed to, you know, to write to the guy. And it's like, wow, it's correct, but it's not still not working. <coughs> so he said, um, you know, he came back with this, well, replace the string, Joe, with the very, you know, I, I tried a bunch of different things, right? And actually his, his ultimate solution was, I read the documentation, the documentation said basically, and his email came back and said, well, just don't put, put it in the brackets, you know? I tried every other combination of brackets, no bracket quotes, single yeah. quotes, double quotes, you know, hieroglyphics, and nothing worked. And, uh, but anyways, the, the, this was the routine, which was card, and then find by SQL, which is Rails way, and then within the parentheses, you stick what the query is that you want to use. So it's just pure MySQL at that point in time. The documentation uh, had brackets, and uh, and he said oh, take so it off. you were giving it an array, but I was giving it like a, you know an array of one string, right? So brackets are arrays in Ruby, and uh, but it was somehow chomping the, the uh, this is text. where this is where Ruby's lack of typing can sort of bite you if, it's not, if there's nothing there that's saying, oh, you gave me an array, I don't want an array, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say in in the, you know, four. <laughs> in the several months that I've been doing this stuff. It's the only bug that I uh, that I actually haven't been able to solve on my own, which which is remarkable. I mean, it doesn't say anything about me. I don't know what your experiences were uh, with it or other people, but there's a lot that you can do on your own with just a little bit of uh, exerted effort. As you get into more sort of sophisticated areas, you start to push the limits maybe of the databases or the web servers or your. But you know, here just in the span of uh, you know under two hours, we've kind of. You jump from Yahoo to Google to different websites, pull data down. We'll pull stuff up from a MySQL databases. We'll pull data in that is sort of, you know, predefined within your application space for testing. And you can do all that stuff fairly safely. Um, I think that the, you know, the message from Ruby on Rails is that if you've got sort of models that you can work with and you've got, you know, sort of good guides that you can follow, and there are tracks that you can stay on. It's you know it's a it's a good safe way to learn about stuff. Um, but from a MySQL standpoint, I fully expect folks here who have a lot of knowledge about MySQL. You know you can really you could you could produce basic reporting very quickly without without a lot of problems. So questions, comments. When you put when you put in Ruby getting large. Uh, are there any management kind of facilities in the language to help you to cope with them? With deployments, you mean, or with the programs themselves? W w with both, essentially, because you have to write it and remember and co compartmentalize your methods, all of these type right. of things. Well, I mean, and it's, also all it's all classes and objects, just like uh, Java. No, no, with well, the Java classes and objects is not enough. You have packages in Java. Uh, this has... This has uh, modules. Also, also, it, has, it has modules. Modules. I see. And okay. modules behave like a packages in Java? Slightly used. I see. You, just, you, you include them or you require them and you can basically tell what directories they're stored in. And they're actually not compiled. They're not, you know, zipped up like jar files in Java. They're just, they're, you know, .rb files. So you, you does it mean that module corresponds to the directory? No. Does it, I'm sorry? Well, it can, but it I mean, it's mod it's modules, are, modules are a hierarchical <laughs> namespace. <laughs> modules are a hierarchical namespace. You don't, you don't have to use it if you don't want to. Rails, with Rails, you can do one of two things. One is there are folders within your hierarchy that are accessible. If you put files in there, you put routines in there, they're accessible throughout <coughs> your application. So if you put code in, like, the public folder or in one of the folders, that's defined for that purpose is the library folder. Is that the other one? But yeah, how, if it is so, so easy accessible, how do you uh, solve the problem of name clashing? Name collision. You, you can name, name collision. classes just like you would. Like in Java, you have packages. You can nest your modules just the same way. <laughs> right, like for instance, there's you know, class next colon colon FTP. So you can have you know, class foo colon colon FTP. Those are two separate classes that are unrelated to each other. And, and even if you look at the, the Rails code that, that you saw out of the box, you saw that it was active record colon colon base. Base is a class in the active record module. Yeah, I'm trying to understand the scalability of the language because it's uh, important. You, you commit to small things, after that you grow, 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 and finally you see a language doesn't scale up, but you already caught. <laughs> and that's it. There's no way back, no way forward. 
what you, you know something interesting though, is most applications yeah. probably the database is the main bottleneck. So mm -hmm. you're talking about code organization scalability. Yeah. No, no, not performance. No, you're talking about what happens. Yeah, yeah, you have a lot of. It's not really different from Java in this way. You have you have a hierarchical namespace. You can use it or not. Right, but and you can nest them in directories if you want. You can manage it exactly like the same way. So you could you could create a folder for your modules and nest them all the way down, and you can make it look exactly like a Java project. But you also have a way not to do that, right? You can make an absolute mess of it if you want to. Yeah. 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 That's also true with Java. You can put everything in one packet if you want. Yeah, you can put everything in the packet. Put everything in one file. Right. No, but the, here, if you put it in, in one package, you, you have one package. But here, you have multiple packages, and you still cannot manage that. <coughs> here you can. What, why can't you manage it? No, so you said that you can mess up uh, even if you have a multiple namespaces. You could be at a place where exactly what you said will come about. You're going to have name clashes. But if you do package them, you're avoiding it the same way as in Java or .NET. Right. Generally, if you have unrelated classes, you should put them in, in, in different packages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the performance side, are there benchmarks? I, I know that's one of the criticisms I've heard, is that nobody really knows how well performance-wise Ruby on Rails scales. Is, is, has anyone done I've it? Never, I've never heard anybody who has uh, practically deployed an application that, you know, I haven't talked to everybody, but uh, <coughs> that, that cites it for poor performance. I mean, ODO's got, you know, they claim millions of hits. So for, for most everybody in this room, unless you're tuning the website for, you know, a very large commercial sort of uh, operation, I haven't heard that you're going to hit those limits. Now, I, you know, it'd be great if one of you did and could come back and tell us about it. But that's uh, the point where you probably start to, you know, rewrite some of your Ruby and C once you do yeah. when that when that happens. And the thing but is, we're all—it's kind of a race because the, you know, the the servers and the processors, all the stuff's just getting faster. So it's <coughs> let's put it this way: the, the trade-off is um, it, it's very obvious that you can spend a lot less resources building applications with Ruby on Rails. It's just it's just evident, right? That I mean I, to me it seems like a couple of people could do the work of five or eight in, in most other environments. So the question is what's more expensive to you? And if it's people, I'd go with Ruby. If it's hardware, not on this planet, but if it's hardware, I'd go maybe something else. You know? But the thing is something else might mean a totally different development model. So But, but I haven't seen good I haven't seen good measures. Yeah been talking to several people, potential business partners, about creating a massive medical information website. This uh, technology intrigues me, but I am concerned about the performance. And I'm also concerned about another issue that you, you sort of mentioned, which I thought about a lot. You said that you could embed Ruby code inside a couple of tags. But that assumes to me, and you said it was similar to what PHP does, yeah, that similar. assumes to me that your server is capable of handling right. that kind of production, big massive commercial production output. Right. So that to me says it's probably going to be Apache. But I'm hearing horror stories about Apache working with this. Yeah, no, I don't know. The, the, um, I think that's Apache on Windows. Is, is, it just, is it OK, Max? I mean, I, I use both, but oh, yeah. primarily I, I, I do most smaller development in Windows and migrate. Mm -hmm. but, Again, I think I know Ruby's been ported to Sigwin and you can use Apache's uh, Sigwin's Apache and it would be there. That may okay. be better because it's more more of a Unix-like packaging yeah. system there too. <coughs> it'd be it'd be great to find out. This would be a good question. I'm actually going to go to the Rails conference. I don't know if anybody else is at Where the end is? of May, but uh, I'll ask that question. Where is it? It's in Oregon. You go. So, so we we've got some. I wouldn't say big production, but we've got some some Ruby applications that, that are being used inside our corporation. Um, I work for the Miter Corporation in Bedford, mm -hmm. so we've got Ruby applications that are that are handling five thousand users. You know, nothing big, but um, well, to, I'm a hitch per day. Um, I don't know. Dur during our during our high season, you know, you're getting <laughs> you're getting a few thousand users using it per day. You know, hitting it, you know, in surges during the day. So you so you might be getting, you know, ten or fifteen concurrent users at once. Um, yeah. Nothing big. Um, yeah. It depends. Depends upon what the users are doing. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It does. But well, actually, these are pretty data heavy. 
So that so that basically you're pounding the database and not the web server. Um, well, yes and no. So so the the way that that Rails winds up getting deployed in production environments is a lot of people set it up with Apache, and then you can go a couple of routes. The way that we like to go now is we use um, the the uh, mod proxy balancer part of Apache that shoots the HTTP request through to a Ruby web server. We prefer Mongrel over WebBrick. WebBrick's just not, yeah. not there for production. What Rails encourages quite a bit is um, caching a lot of your data and caching it out to disk and then making Apache do a lot of the work for you. <coughs> Write it out to HTML files and then use rewrite rules to pick up those HTML files and then kill the HTML files once the data gets stale. Um, another way that you can hook up to Apache is through FCGI, which we've had issues with. But you know you can hook up, I think Python, and I think you can hook up PHP to Apache that way too. And then you know you have Apache communicating with a Ruby interpreter. We found that to be flaky after running for long periods of time. Like when, the, when we would restart the Apache server to do log rotations and stuff like that, we would have zombie Ruby processes laying around. Um, so we've gone to, to an all mongrel setup. And that's worked relatively well for us. So far. Does Rails use mod Ruby? Ra Rails doesn't. Rails, I think, will use mod Ruby. It'll use fast CGI. It'll use Mongrel. It's open to using a bunch of these things. So you can you can use WebBrick. I, I mean, it. You can also use light HTTP um, if you want to go that route as well. What, that's a non-Apache server. That, yeah, that's another. That's another uh, non-Apache you know, web server. So Rails is pretty flexible in, in how you want to deploy it. There's a guy, I'm trying to think of his name, he, um, he worked on a newspaper website, and then he went to, is it Engine Company? What's the name of the Ruby web hosting company, the Rails web hosting company? Did you think of Text Drive? Or? Not Text Drive, but, but sort of the other one. Engineering? Engine something. Or, but, but he's, he's kind of a specialist. Engineer. He's got a book coming out, I think, on Capistrano. If you uh, look up on Amazon, and Capistrano is a tool for deployment of kind of larger scale systems. So people, there are some experts in this. In the same way that if I had a, you know, a website that was spitting out, you know, a million or getting a million hits a day, I might have somebody sort of spending some some technical time on that. You do the same thing. So I think the jury's out still. I mean, it's a legitimate question. Uh, the results are definitely not in. But there's no indication that I've seen that says, you know, after you hit 50 users, the system suddenly dies. Things are kind of beyond that, which is nice. Well, the big question I have, you, know, you, you were saying that uh, Ruby is interpreted. It doesn't use the bytecode scheme at all right now. Right. So it does uh, mod Ruby work that way as well? It just interprets every time there's a, uh, a, a, a query? Because I've, I've, I've been in a situation with PHP where you know I'm getting like you know a quarter million, half million hits a day um, on <coughs> database intensive um, you know application, and, and if you don't have the accelerator in there, it still sort of fall. So I'm just wondering uh, what happens with Ruby under those conditions. Is it also going to still sort of fall because it's interpreted? Hmm. And it has to reinterpret every every uh, every uh, effect that it gets. Certainly, what I mean, what we have seen is people have recoded specific parts of uh, their their products, their applications, their uh, in C to to pick up that additional mm -hmm. speed performance, um, and they've done that for performance reasons. But I've never seen anything that anybody's had had to do that because it like didn't work, because it broke, because it exceeded some inherent limits. Um, but it's it's a great question. I don't think we'll have. Well, well, just to talk to that a little bit, the, the, depending on how you set up your Ruby process, like you can stand it, you can stand it up like a standard CGI process where everything will get reinterpreted on every hit. But if you stand it up with fast CGI, or if you run it behind Mongrel or something like that, like fast CGI keeps a Ruby interpreter alive. So <coughs> you, would, you know, the first hit will come in, and then that will cause Ruby to pull in all of its, you know, to interpret all your models, interpret right. all that stuff. But then all the objects are already there in the interpreter. And so the, the second request that comes in after that is just executing objects that are already held in the interpreter scheme. Uh, but how does uh, mod Ruby work? I don't know how mod Ruby works. I've never used it. I, think, I, mean, I haven't used it either. But I think it's like mod, I think it's basically like mod Perl, that basically it, it avoids you're having to re-exec uh, an interpreter each time. But you know, Perl does Perl does compile it into 
does compile at least internally, whereas Ruby doesn't. So R Ruby, the, when they do the initial parse, they repart, they reparse, or they there must be one some form of internal um, representation. I think the good news is, it, I mean, I, I think the I think the thing to do is to try and get some data. Right. Usually, the I know it's not like Perl that has an explicit, you know, compile step before it starts mm -hmm. interpreting. But okay, right. maybe they do strictly. Yeah. yeah. No, they 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 they, they must <coughs> have to pass over yeah. the thing just to know how to do some of the output method calls. Yeah. You can do it. The good news is, I I really think it's going to, from a, a a speed performance tuning perspective, it's going to get better, and and uh, I've got a lot of confidence in that. So, but I, I think the thing to do, you know, you got a big site, you got to try a couple different things and yeah. consider the alternatives. There are some limits in how much optimization like that really can do because any piece of code could possibly open up open up a class and add a, and, and change the definition of a method. Yeah, the same problem. So it's, yeah. Yeah. The problem with all of these, they can't do a lot of optimization because, because they're too dynamic. It's, it's good information. The well, thing. what I, I would suggest though, there's a guy named Avi Bryant and look up his blog and he talks a lot about the small talk community and how <laughs> you can do probabilistic optimizations where you sort of guess as to what method would be called. So over time as your web server runs a long time, yeah, you could replace it with any method, but you know, you make a probabilistic jump, you get to branch prediction territory, yeah. but you can start speeding these things up pretty quick. This is probably you have the problem with the variables can be tied and they can be tied at any point. It just eliminates all types of optimizations you could otherwise do. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything. It sends a variable tied to the Ruby does not have that, at least. But not yet. <laughs> so the MySQL server anyway so probably won't yet. be the bottleneck, I guess, from the sounds of it. So <laughs> Ruby, you or Ruby, you would, you would declare the appropriate process and implementation. Any other questions? You've all been very patient. There's also a website that I set up, uh, Greater Boston Ruby and Rails.com, and I've got a bunch of just loose ends of things that I've, you know, over time learned. There's a Ruby group that meets. And that's um, boston.rubygroup.org is that URL for that group. Thank you very much. Oh, no. Yeah.